Let's now look at the Bruch Pagan Godfrey test. Now, if you if you notice uh, the first three tests that we have looked at, the Park, the Glacier, and the Godfrey quantity test, make a very strong assumption that a particular x variable has an influence on the heterostatic variance. That is not a problem at all if you are in a bivariate context because you only have one x variable. But that particular test formulation becomes problematic in the context of multiple or in the context of a multiple regression model. How do you choose which x variable affects the variance of uh, the error term? That is the heterostatic variance. If for example, you say, well, I'll start by doing graphical plots to see which of these X variables has a, has a systematic relationship with the estimated residual squared. That's fine. What if you find that all X variables have a systematic relationship? So which one will you choose and why? You begin to see that it is an arbitrary procedure. So now, Bruch formulates a more general test and says look we don't have to look at a specific x variable but we just say well the heterostatic variance depends on all the other x variables all x variables that you have plus any other additional variables that you might want to consider <coughs> In the way the test is formulated, you can see that it is really, really very, very general. <clears throat> All right. So now in the context of a bivariate regression, the Bruch, uh, Park and Godfrey test is very simple because you only have one X variable, but the procedure itself, the logic of the procedure doesn't change as you transition to a mod variate context. So he says that the heterostatic variance itself is a linear function of the x variable. Okay, it is a linear function of the x variable. If we had several x variables, then we would also have plus alpha 3 experience plus alpha 4 tenure plus any any other including gender race and other geographical region variables that you might want to consider okay now <clears throat> the test itself is much more general than what we have here but we will still proceed so what he says is you have to estimate that regression and you get your estimated residuals you square them that get your residual sum of squares here and you generate the maximum likelihood estimator of the variance so the maximum the maximum likelihood estimator of the variance is just residual sum of squares divided by n in in your ordinary list of squares we would have said divided by n minus k so maximum likelihood does not say minus k it just divides by n and it stops there okay then from there from there he says they say now construct some variable called pi which is the ratio of your estimated residual squared over this maximum likelihood estimator of the variance so that ratio pi is central because that's what we are going to regress on all the x variables we have in our context the bivariate context we are regressing that on education okay and from it we will obtain the explained sum of squares and then we divide them by two 
that test statistic follows a chi-squared distribution. That's essentially what he says. It follows a chi-squared distribution um, where m here is the number of coefficients estimated in the auxiliary regression, this one. Okay. So, so you have, you have the m minus 1 at some alpha. And so, obviously, this is how you will state your procedure. The error variance is constant. You can see that it's the same hypothesis we are testing, but the test procedures differ in terms of the test statistic used as well as the test equation, how it is formulated. The alternative says it is non-constant. And the test statistic here is um, you can just call it chi squared uh, chi squared observed is equal to half of the explained sum of squares, and this follows a chi squared distribution with the m minus one degrees of freedom alpha. And the decision rule is if the chi squared observed is bigger than the critical value we get here, we must reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Uh, otherwise, we should fail to do so. So let's try to do the 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 Bruch bug and good for chess. Um, all right, I already have some information here. We estimated this already, right? We estimated this regression, and these are the residual sum of squares. So what we need to do here is to get our maximum likelihood estimator of the error variance, which is equal to, um, did I sum this before? Okay, it's equal to the sum of all this divided by n, which is 50. So it will be this much. Okay, now having done that. The next thing is to adjust each one of these by this number here. That's what they are saying. We are going to generate a variable called pi. This pi is your residual sum of squared. It's your residuals estimated residual squared over the maximum likelihood estimator of uh, the variance of the error term. So now we generate our p which is equal to, now we are dividing each one of these by this number, okay? Um, so let me fix that one because we're going to use the same maximum likelihood estimator. Then you produce that variable. Then you regress this variable on education you see that? So let's do that. Um, data, data analysis, regress. Um, our dependent is P. And our explanatory is education. Right. That's all we need. We don't need that one. Okay. So we get this here. But what we want from this is the explained sum of squares. Where do we get those? We get them from this ANOVA table here. Um, that's where we get them. So this is... Let me just blow this up. So this is your explained. Okay. 
So regression sum of regression sum of squares. Regression sum of squares is your explained sum of squares. So it's that number we are looking for, right? So he says that now your chi squared observed is equal to 0 0.5 times ESS. That's what he says, right? That's what they say, I mean, it's not just one person. That's what they say, 0 0.5, that's the half there, half times ESS, okay? Okay, so now this is 0 0.5 times our ESS is that number there. We get 0 0.7333. Then we want to do that at 5%. That's the level of significance we are working with. So our, our chi squared critical is 2. The M there is 2Y because we only have two estimated coefficients in the auxiliary regression, alpha 1 and alpha 2. So, so now we have 2. Okay, let's go to the chi-squared distribution. Um, here are the degrees of freedom. We want 0 0.05, which is here, and this is your one. This, this, this row here is your first degree of freedom, your one degree of freedom at 5%. So we are looking at that number then, 3.84, okay, 3.84. Now remember, when we formulated the test, we made the following uh, decision criteria. If the chi observed, which is constructed as half ESS, is greater than the chi squared critical, which is 3.84, we must reject the, the null, this claim of constant variance. Otherwise, we must fail to do so, okay? Now, if you look at what we have here, this is our chi squared critical. Our chi squared critical is 3.84. Our chi squared observed, uh, okay, let me put it there. Our chi-squared observed is 0 0.734. It is clear that the chi-squared observed is smaller than the chi-squared critical, which means it is in the unshaded region. It is in the region where we fail to reject. Do you see that? And that's precisely what we... We, we are going to do, we must fail to reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level of significance and obviously conclude that the error variance is constant. Okay, we fail to reject this, this null. Do you see that now the Bruch, Park and Godfrey test has come to the same conclusion as the Park, as the Glaser, as the Godford quant test, but it's not always the case. Sometimes the B, BPG might detect the hetero when others have failed to do. But in this particular case, they have all come to the same conclusion. But this is a more general test. You can also see that its functional form is different and the formulation of the test procedure itself is different. It uses the chi squared whereas the Godford quant test uses the F and the other two tests use the T approach. But for interest sake, notice because we are in the bivariate context, if you look at the coefficient in the surrogate regression here and look at the p-value, it is very clear that, that the, the p-value here is not significant at all meaning that the surrogate the, the surrogate variable p is not being explained by 
education okay let's stop here